Hi, I'm Michelle Segrist, and welcome to the Factory of the Future podcast. This podcast is inspired by my three-volume book series on the evolution of modern manufacturing. Each episode features engaging conversations with game-changing experts discussing the processes and innovations that are changing the landscape of modern manufacturing. Thank you so much for listening. Please do me a favor and leave me a five-star rating on iTunes and take just a couple of seconds to leave a review. And then go ahead and hit that subscribe button right now so you don't miss a single episode. Today, I am very happy to welcome Ari Panagulius as my expert guest. Ari is the Director of Condition Monitoring and the World Class Test Lab at Hydro Inc. He has an engineering degree from the University of Michigan and has a decade of experience with Hydro. In Ari's experience, he has seen a big shift toward more digitalization being used in manufacturing, in particular with regard to efficiency and mobility. His specialty is condition monitoring, and we're going to talk a lot about that. He also believes that the ease of connectivity will change the industry in the same way that smartphones have changed the way we engage with the world. Today, we're going to dive into a deep conversation about what the future of manufacturing looks like from his perspective. We will also talk about how a shift in power production will reshape the industry for legacy equipment vendors. I'm really excited about this conversation, but first I want to tell you just a little bit about Hydro. As the largest independent pump rebuilder in the world, Hydro has provided engineering expertise, pump repair, and support services to the industry since 1969. Hydro's mission is to work hand-in-hand with its valued customers to optimize the performance and reliability of their pumping systems by evaluating and understanding root causes of pump degradation or failure and by providing unbiased engineering analysis, quality workmanship, and responsive field service for improved plant operation. Hydro has developed a reputation of quality and reliability throughout the pump industry. The detailed inspections, work scopes, and repair plans meet and typically exceed OEM standards. Hydro prides itself in providing its customers the detailed information required to properly evaluate their pump's condition. From its inception, Hydro's core competency has been pump rebuilding. Managers and technical staff all have extensive experience in the pump industry and have previously worked for major pump companies. As a result of having continually added experienced pump people to the organization, Hydro has a diversified and in-depth pump knowledge that is unique in the industry. With 25 years of training and close cooperation between its worldwide companies, Hydro is a leader in engineered improvements and the life cycle extension for pumps. For more information, head on over to www.hydroinc.com. A link is in the show notes. Now, without any further delay, I'm really excited to welcome Ari to the podcast so that we can really dive into a deep conversation about the future of manufacturing. Welcome, Ari. Hi, Michelle. Thanks for having me on. Of course. I'm so happy that you're here. And before we get started, I know a lot about your background and about your experience, but I was wondering if you could just share a little bit about yourself and your experience and background to the listeners and tell them why you are an expert on condition monitoring and pump testing? Well, I guess, uh, how far back do you want me to go? <laughs> <laughs> Just as far back as you want, whatever you think is appropriate. You can, you can brag about yourself a little. Sure. Well, I will say this, you know, the term expert is an interesting one to use. I think we often refer to that as somebody who has a lot of experience in a field. Right. And in a lot of ways, it's, it's a helpful word to qualify somebody. But I do think that in general, in the industry, we have an over-reliance on quote-unquote experts. And I don't necessarily view myself as an expert at anything, certainly not condition monitoring. I think the key is to keep learning about this specific thing or about a broader industry in general. I, I do remember when I first started at Hydro in 2011, and I met, uh, the superintendent of one of our shops in Chicago, and he was the first person I ever met at Hydro. And he said to me, learn as much as you can. That's and great I really advice, to, always. Yeah. yeah, I mean, great advice. Great advice, especially yeah. for a young engineer just coming out of college. Uh, but I really tried to hold on to that. And 
I think if we all come to our work with that approach, there really are no experts. We're all just trying to learn as much as we can. Maybe that's the goal is just to know as much as you can that you can talk expertly about a topic. And I think you definitely qualify there. So I did get my start at Hydro's test facility in Chicago, Illinois in 2011. Mm -hmm. I started as a junior engineer, as as would be appropriate. Mm -hmm. Um, I I didn't know a pump from a flange. I'm going to be honest with you. (laughs) And uh, I learned quickly because I had to. And over the course of years in our laboratory, learning about rotating equipment, understanding its hydraulic performance, understanding its mechanical performance, I was able to build up experience with things like vibration analysis things like instrumentation, accelerometers, proximity probes, all the things that go into the monitoring of rotating equipment performance and health. And so that was really a great environment for me to learn and understand, not just about equipment and how it's used, but actually running it myself. I'm a very hands-on learner. So being able to play with this effectively large Lego set of equipment in a safe environment was just a tremendous way to learn and grow. Yeah, that's a great way to describe it, a Lego set, because especially at Hydro, you're always taking things apart and putting them back together in a different way, it seems like. So that's a perfect way to describe what Hydro does. I think from the aftermarket side, which that's where Hydro's position within the industry is the pump aftermarket. We're not an OEM. We don't make our own pumps. We just take existing equipment and re-engineer it and, and bring it back to life, really. So when a pump arrives, there's a a colleague of mine who refers to us as sort of a Frankenstein company where we get these effectively dead pumps who have failed and we bring them back to life through really high, really in-depth quality inspection and analysis, understanding the failure modes they've gone through, and then either bring them back to original form or make an improvement that will hopefully mitigate and extend the life of the equipment. Yeah. And Hydro is doing some really forward thinking things like using 3D printing to create new impellers and things like this and redesigning and re-engineering, reverse engineering pumping system to really pull it apart and see the guts and then put it back together in a, a new way that makes it run even better than new, right? Well, that's our goal and, and that's our need. <clears throat> I think, again, necessity is the mother of invention. We're not an OEM. We don't manufacture new product. So our focus has to be in this specific area. We have to be great at this in order for us to to exist and, and succeed, frankly. That's right. Because the podcast is all about the future of manufacturing and the factory of the future, let's talk about this shift that you're seeing toward more digitalization in manufacturing. Tell us what you're seeing. Well, I think generally, before we even get into that, we have to understand where where the industry is in general. So okay, the industrial yeah. industry certainly is losing a lot of experienced workers. We're That's seeing right. a class of workers retired that has just a wealth of knowledge about maybe a particular industry, maybe a particular plant, maybe even within a specific plant, how a system functions best. And so with that knowledge leaving the industry, there's a big gap to fill. On top of that, I think we're seeing a lot of folks, particularly, for example, in steel, reduce their workforce. So not only do you now have a lot of knowledge leaving, but you have less people to rely on to run the same operation. Yeah, we've been talking about this gap, this manufacturing talent gap for a long time. It's like you said, these older guys are moving out and retiring, and they're taking with them this wealth of knowledge and experience. And then the new guys that are coming in are much more into the digital age. And I think this is kind of changing the shift of how how we see things in manufacturing. Well, exactly. I I think in the past where you might have a very robust apprenticeship program, for example, or not even an apprenticeship program, but just a culture where you learn from the people who've been there ahead of you. I think nowadays, because we don't always have that afforded to us, you might look to technology to supplement where those gaps are. And and I think certainly, you know, my generation, for example, looks to technology with a lot of comfort, a lot of ease of use. We live in a connected world. We've grown up with cell phones. We've grown up with email. We've grown up with different technologies that help us in our day to day. And so I think there's a comfort turning to technology to help fill in those gaps where the knowledge might have been from previous generations. How do you see the older guys that are still there? I, I hate to call them older guys, but the the older generation of operators and engineers who 
are trying to learn this new digital business, how, how do you see them responding and receiving and embracing that? I think that some of the, some of the quote unquote older folks are some of the biggest champions of this. Right. Yeah. I, I think, I think they've seen the frustrations of the way equipment is operated or the way certain processes are done and, and they'll look to anything if it can help out. I mean, I think process oriented folks who have sort of succeeded in those roles and maybe risen up through the ranks of a company, they definitely see opportunities. And, and I don't think just because it's technology, they would be resistant to that as a solution. In fact, some of the folks we've partnered with and had success are folks that have been at a particular power plant for 30 years. Wow. Yeah. When they see something working, is that what it takes to embrace it? Because in the beginning, they have to be a little bit resistant, right? Because they're just used to doing things a certain way for the past 30 years. Well, I do think there's a bit of that culture of, you know, this is the way we've always done it. I think that we all run into that in our Mm -hmm. day-to-day lives, let alone in our professional lives. Change can be challenging. Change can be hard. And mapping out a process for implementing a change can be one of the most daunting steps of it. But like I said, I think that if folks really see the value that can be added through these systems, uh, it, it really hasn't mattered age, experience, role, whatever, there's been an embracing of of that technology for sure. Good. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about the shift toward more digitalization. And maybe you can tell me about some of the efficiency improvements that have been made just in the past decade or so, or what you see coming down the pike. Well, sure. So we talked about the knowledge gap between Mm -hmm. folks retiring and leaving with that wealth of knowledge and it needing to be filled in. If you look at a lot of the equipment that's out there at, let's say, older steel plants or older power plants, um, a lot of the equipment, by and large, is not instrumented. It's not connected. Now, there are some ways that data can be collected, either from direct route-based data collection, where you're actually going out to the equipment and checking on it. There's never going to be a replacement for being near a piece of equipment. But We talked about how there's less folks left to manage that same amount of equipment. And also, there's a real need to have real-time monitoring on it. So whereas you might have a new plant that's got all the bells and whistles on it, that's got every pump, every motor, every turbine, every gearbox instrumented to the nines, you're not going to see that in an older plant. But their need is still as great, if not greater. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So I think people are trying to navigate how can they instrument their equipment effectively and economically to get the information they need to better make decisions. And if they can make better decisions about maintenance, if they can understand this bearing is going to fail, this seal is going to fail, uh, this equipment has been operating for X amount of years or X amount of cycle, those better informed maintenance decisions can help save money. It's not necessarily all this pie in the sky stuff, machine learning, AI predictive analytics. That stuff has a role too, but mm-hmm. it's sometimes the real pragmatic practical stuff that saves money. Is there still a balance in this instrumentation that you're talking about, the remote monitoring more possible? Is is there a balance between that and still the old school way of standing there and just touching and holding the machine and feeling the machine and hearing the machine? I, I think there's definitely a balance to be struck. I mean, look, everyone's on a sort of different data analytics journey, if you will. Um, And that's not my term. That's a term that's been used in the industry. But if you're an older plant, maybe the first step is connecting that equipment, right? Maybe the first step is adding instruments that can see the important information that you need to make a decision or that you need to determine, do I need to go out to that piece of equipment to collect more information? So that first step of connectivity is where most folks are at. Can just about any piece of equipment be retrofitted with some type of instrumentation? Sure, sure, absolutely. I mean, I think you have to determine, you know, what type of variable are you looking to measure on a particular piece of equipment to detect a failure mode? I think some folks have have done tremendous work in identifying what are all the different variables that you need for a specific piece of equipment. EPRI has done tremendous research on all the different failure modes for different pieces of equipment and what are the associated instruments needed to detect those. Now, some, of course, are more valuable than others or more frequently referred to than others, but that information is out there for sure. How do companies make this shift? What can they do to begin the process of shifting toward a digital business? 
Is it just something small to begin with, or they have to? Well, I, I, sure, I, sure like, I sure like to know the answer. <laughs> um, I think yeah. the answer looks different for different folks, and I, I don't mean to punt on the question, but I do think that it, it's a little bit more complex depending on the industry you're in, and depending on sort of the way that your business goes about it. Just when I've worked with our end users on these systems, I've seen it implemented very differently from one end user to the next, even if they're in the same industry, the same region, produce the same product. Do you think that most companies are effectively embracing digitalization and what the future of manufacturing is looking like? Or do you think they're waiting for some revelation? Or do you think they're jumping on it? I think it's a little bit of a combination. I think more the waiting, actually, at least in the United States. I've seen a lot of folks embrace it from a theoretical standpoint, mm -hmm. understand the value that it could bring. But I think, I mean, this year in particular with COVID has been a challenge. And, well, sure. and investing in new technologies is not exactly at the forefront of everyone's mind. I think survival is really at the forefront of everyone's mind as it should be. That's right. Um, but I, I do think there's a little bit of an overwhelming sense of you know, how do I do this? Who do I partner with? There are so many companies out there that offer a solution, whether it be a particular sensor or a particular software platform or a particular integration platform into an existing site historian. And I'm guessing for folks that this is something they're looking at as a potential tool. It's not their day job to necessarily be worried about it. It can be a bit overwhelming to determine what the best path forward is. And that sense of being overwhelmed can sometimes lead to hesitation or trepidation in terms of making a decision. That makes perfect sense. And I, I don't want to skip over what you said about COVID and what COVID has done to manufacturing is significant, a lot of ways. And one of those ways is it has forced us to embrace remote monitoring because not everybody can be there. Not everybody can be present in the factory or the plant or at the installation we're limited now to how many people can be there. So it's forcing us to be a little bit more reliant on instrumentation, wouldn't you think? I do. I think that the customers that we work with, the end users that, for example, partner with us, they've been very thankful to be able to log in from home securely and safely and see the status of their equipment real time. I think that has eased a lot of anxiety about the potential for failure when they're not at their work site. Uh, certainly, it's a benefit for us to help provide that back-end support of analyzing different vibration and temperature signals coming through our software. But certainly for customers, it's it's been a big relief to have that access. And, and I think it goes to say for digital tools as well, I think all these meeting platforms that have come up have been a big success story in the pandemic. Absolutely. There's no question. And again, it's forced us to learn how to use these. I mean, things like Zoom and Microsoft Teams and all these different platforms have been around for a while, but we just haven't really used them. It's been easier to just pick up the phone and call someone. And so now we're seeing that we can meet face to face without meeting face to face, so to speak. The mm -hmm. technology is there. We just have to use it. I'd like to talk more specifically about condition monitoring, since this is one of your areas of expertise. I mentioned in the opening about this ease of connectivity. And so I think this is a good segue since we kind of got into that conversation. This is becoming more and more important, connectivity and the ease of connectivity. So you say that this will change the industry. And your example is the way smartphones change the way we engage with the world. So let's talk about this. What do you mean by this? Well, I think if you look back, for example, in 1995, I was a kid at the time. But folks didn't generally walk around with cell phones. I mean, people had them, of course. Right. It was a thing, but it wasn't, it wasn't our day to day thing where we would all walk around with a phone, much less a phone connected to the internet with all the capabilities that we have today. If you think about how behaviors have changed. That's right. From then to now. I mean, it's, it's almost night and day, even though it's a short amount of time. The way we connect with each other, the way we communicate with each other, the way we interact with the world is really through a device that's in our pocket. That's right. It's amazing. And say, it, it is amazing. And, and I think that, you know, personal habits change differently than industrial habits. But I think if we look at some of the reasons why we're all able to connect, I mean, the cost of phones, yes, it is cost of a new iPhone. Of course, nobody likes paying for that. No. Uh, <laughs> but the ease of access to getting a phone and getting connected, you know, it's is reasonable. And I think the cost came down from where they might have been in, you know, the early 1990s or late 1980s to now. 
Uh, but when you think just, about it, it's a computer. I mean, it's a computer oh, that you're carrying around absolutely. in your pocket. So and it gets better and better all the time. I think if you looked similarly at you know condition monitoring and in industrial applications in let's say 2000 or 2005, there were a limited number of providers for instruments. There were a limited number of ways you could connect. I mean, you have probably had to hardwire this system into a local DCS in order to get that data coming through. Nowadays, there's so many platforms out there, so many software companies, so many instrument providers, and so many different ways to communicate. A lot of times when we work with customers and end users, we're sending data over LTE coverage in places that don't have Wi-Fi or access to any network. I mean, if you're thinking about remote pumping stations, they may not have a Wi-Fi network. They may not have a LAN network that we can mm -hmm. tap into, um, and they may not want to. And so being able to rely on wireless transmission through cellular companies has been a, a huge way for us to bring the cost down, to not have to worry about hardwiring systems in and manage data that way. So I think if you look at just the amount of solutions that are available today, it's grown just tremendously from where we might have been at in the early 2000s. And I think it's going to continue to grow and the ease of connectivity will continue to grow. And as it does, the cost of investment is going to come down. Mm hmm. I mean, that's an interesting point. It, it does cost something. It, there is an investment to be made to be this connected. But on the other side, does it actually save money for the end user? Well, and that's the thing is that a lot of people are, are, are making big promises out there about the, the savings. But it's like anything else. If you use this tool properly, yes, it can save you money. It can save you headaches. But if it's, if it's out there and not being used the right way, it's not going to just magically save money. It's certainly not a magic wand that's just going to come in and boom, put money in your pocket. But if it's used the right way, if it's used in a way to prevent catastrophic failures from happening, it's used in a way to prevent downtime that mm -hmm. you didn't plan for. I mean, these are real ways to save money. Can you think about the cost of a process being shut down because a piece of equipment fails unexpectedly for a power plant, for example? Yeah, I mean, it's millions a day. It. it could be. It, yeah. And, and over a piece of equipment that the cost of repair or the cost to maintain is is pennies compared to what it can produce. What do you think is kind of the state of the condition monitoring industry right now? And on the other side of that, what do you think the future holds? I think a lot of end users are trying to navigate and figure out how to digitize their own assets now. So how in terms of how do we get them connected? What do we need to have connected in the first place? Because not every little process pump or not every motor needs to be connected. But critical pieces of equipment do or maybe not critical pieces of equipment, but that second tier, the value might be there as well. So figuring out where the value is for end users is critical. Mm -hmm. And that's going to require some resources from them or partnering with somebody who can help them with those decisions. And then I think navigating just the different solutions out there. You know, wh which type of sensors do I need? Who am I going to partner with? What type of software am I going to use? Do we have a site historian in-house that we rely on? Do we need a new piece of software? If we have a new piece of software, how do we learn that software and make it part of our day to day? Yeah, that sounds like how you would approach someone who is just starting out, just starting to digitalize. You ask those kinds of questions, but how do you inquire and what kind of questions do you ask a company that's already digitalized to a certain point, but they need to take it to the next level? That's a good question. And I would actually, I would be comfortable deferring to those folks. I think a few years ago, I went down to the Gulf region and went to a high-end refinery for you know one of the major players. We went in there to meet about condition monitoring and the potential solution we could offer for pumps. And when I went in there, I was just amazed to see some of the systems they have in place in terms of predictive maintenance. Mm -hmm. And it was very quick for me to realize, oh, I'm here to learn. <laughs> uh, I'm not here. <laughs> sure. I'm not here for anything else other than to learn. So I do think there are a lot of folks out there at the cutting edge who have experience, probably in the refining sector in particular, and some of the larger power plants. They've had the resources to invest in that over time. They have the people committed to it. I think some of those folks would be the best people to look to in terms of models on how to do this. But it also is interesting because those folks have the resources. And I think there are a lot of smaller industries and smaller companies that don't. And so the solution looks different for them than it might for those larger companies. Well, of course, it's always a customized solution. We know that. It depends on who they are and what industry they're in and what they're producing and all that. It's all about customization. But can you give me an example of maybe like a, just a really simple condition monitoring experience and then maybe one that's top of the line, 
complex, really special, unique condition monitoring system? I'll give you a few that I think are, are good examples. Okay, um, great. And I, I try to stay a little closer to the practical. Because okay. Because I think, I think sometimes in this industry, in the condition monitoring space, we can get overwhelmed with buzzwords. Buzzwords like artificial intelligence, AI, machine learning. And, right. and I really think there's truth to those words. And I think those things are going to shape the way the industry adapts over time. I think machine learning, certainly AI, predictive analytics that are automated, algorithms that learn, those things are important. But some of those things and the way they're presented are certainly in the category of, of buzzwords, things meant to excite us, but not necessarily grounded in reality. So I'll give you two examples that I think are grounded in a more practical approach. One, earlier this year, we were working with a nuclear power plant on the East Coast. They have some pump and motor systems where they have a submerged pump, a vertical style pump that's driven by a submersible motor. So the motor is actually below the pump. And there's really, there's not much of the piece of equipment other than the discharge elbow above ground. They don't really have much in the way of instrumentation to understand the status of that piece of equipment. They have pressure gauges. They can certainly look at the power data going into the motor and make some inferences from that information. But they don't have any mechanical vibration data. They had an unexpected failure on that pump that caused quite a change in the way they operated without that piece of equipment. And it was a little bit painful for them, and they wanted to figure out, well, what can we do to avoid this? So Hydro repaired the pump at one of its facilities, and as part of the repair, we outfitted the pump with submersible accelerometers to measure acceleration and vibration in terms of velocity. We routed those up through the, the discharge head and accessed that data from a wireless transmitter that's sending that data once per hour, full-time waveform, and then overall data once every five minutes. So... They've added a system now that can give them some prediction into how the vibration, how the mechanical performance is trending over time. So we've taken a system that was previously dark with no information. We've added some very simple tools in terms of industrial accelerometers, connected it to a wireless transmission system, and now we can access that data real time and see what's going on with that unit. So instead of an unexpected failure, they've got the ability to see real time what the status is and if there's a trend. If there's a trend towards a vibration level that they would deem to be close to failure or approaching a circumstance that they may want to avoid, perhaps it's based on the flow rate of operation, perhaps it's based on how many hours it's been in operation, we will learn a lot from it. But that's yeah. one practical way that folks are looking to improve their systems. That's fantastic. That's fascinating. And you said you had another example too? Well, I, so that's one specific example. I think looking in a different industry, let's look towards pipeline. We've got a partner that's not just looking to use this solution on what we would call, you know, bad actors or, or pumps that have historically been more maintenance intensive than others, but they're looking to apply this across the pipeline. And when you look at applying this sort of solution across the board to a large number of assets, now you're going to start to see relational components. What happens at this pumping station when vibrations seem to be excessive? What happens at the neighboring pumping station? How are these systems interconnected and related? There's a benefit to that approach for them. But more importantly, for remote stations that are hundreds of miles apart, mm -hmm. allocating your people, your time to each station, if you just say, drive three hours to the station, that's a lot of windshield time. Well, sure. But if you're going out there for a specific purpose, maybe you know a bearing needs to be replaced. Maybe you know that a seal needs to be replaced. Maybe you know you're going out there to check lubrication on a specific motor or pump or whatever the case may be. Now you're going out there, you're armed with information, and you're wisely allocating who's driving where when. So instead of going into a situation blind and saying, okay, I'm going to learn based on my walk around of this equipment and then on to the next one, you're now going out there with more of a purpose, more of a focus. And you're able to allocate, again, people, in this case, and in a spread out pipeline to where they need to be. Fantastic. That's great. I mean, you can already see the benefit in so many different ways of having this kind of connectivity. And also, I mean, Hydro has customers all over the globe. I mean, everywhere and in some truly remote areas. And as we know, most manufacturers are not just in one place. They're in several places all over the world. It's really important for them to be able to see what's going on everywhere. And as you said, not to have to make a trip that maybe is unnecessary. 
or at least be armed with the, what the tools and the information they need when they get there. There's so much oh, absolutely. Benefit. But to your point about the connectivity and sort of the, the global state of things, mm-hmm. I was just remarking to our, our CEO, Mr. Harris, the other day, how truly remarkable it is that in our condition monitoring command center in Chicago, you can walk in and you can see how equipment is operating in Australia, in Europe, in the Caribbean, all over the United States, all real time. Wow. That's amazing. I mean, it, 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 no, it really is. I think sometimes we overlook the astounding nature of the sort of communication systems we've built. I mean, I know that I can, I can text my family in Europe, for example, real time, and they can get back to me. That's amazing. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. But to see what's going on in industrial applications across the globe, it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's, it's all the way cool. It's, it really is. And this is really what the future is looking like. The systems that are not connected now are, I think, considered archaic and maybe even a little bit obsolete in some ways. I think the really cool thing about the, the connected systems or connected world through, through our software could be this. I mean, you've got a lot of folks with similar equipment out there. I mean, let's say you got a BB3 pump at a steel mill in the United States somewhere in the Midwest, mm-hmm. and it's operating a certain way. And you got that same pump model at a power plant in West Texas. And now through the experience of monitoring the one at the steel mill, you can gain some insights perhaps into how the one in Texas might operate. Wow. And so there's all sorts of ways that we can learn and grow and get better at this. And I think that's the key. You know, so how can we leverage that knowledge, that data? into value. Yeah. And that just continues to get uh, more and more complex and more interesting and better and better and better all the time. This is part of this new generation of young people coming in that love technology and love to make things better and write new programs and create new software. It happens so fast. It is, but there's no magic wand. The truth is the same as it was 50 years ago or 100 years ago. It takes work. Well, sure. It takes work. It takes work to dig into the data from a certain pumping system and understand how it might relate to another one in another place entirely. Well, it's kind of like you said about being an expert. We're probably never going to get there. There's always going to be room to learn and improve. I think that's true with people, and it's also true with systems. Absolutely. I want to talk about this shift in power production that's reshaping the future of manufacturing. You've talked about this a lot. Can you explain? what you mean by that? Well, I think we've seen quite a shift, for example, in the United States and how power is produced and how power is managed. So whereas 30 years ago, you know, hydro was doing a lot of work with coal-fired power plants, maintaining their pumps, maintaining boiler feed pumps and, and things of that nature. And as we've seen coal decrease and other industries come up in its place, it's going to be interesting to see how the supply side of those companies or supply side of those industries adapt. Interesting. What are some of the evolutions you've already seen just in the time you've been out there? I think generally for companies like Hydro that have relied on coal-fired power plants, maybe not an over-reliance, but certainly that's been a focus of ours. It's going to be interesting to see how we adapt and shift as the energy industry changes. We have a lot of aging nuclear power plants in the United States, for example, that provide a lot of power. That's right. Um, How are those going to be maintained? How are those plants going to be either extended or replaced. That's a lot of power to replace. I think we've seen challenges in implementing some of the renewable technologies and then some of the associated technologies like gas-fired plants that can come up very quickly and how they maintain their equipment and how they maintain operability. I I just think it's going to be a challenge to see as the way the energy is produced and dispersed changes, how the supporting industries are going to change, how the aftermarket industry changes, for example. That's right. I mean, I think energy always has and how we produce it and how we how we get it and distribute it. It's always going to be part of the conversation that we have to consider. We have to always be thinking about that because it's changing. Yeah, it's changing. And I think the pace of change is also something that we need to be cognizant of. You know, when I think about this, I'm not thinking about it necessarily today. I've sort of got my my mandate for today, is, you know, condition monitoring, right? Uh, hydro test facility. But this is something that's very much on my mind as I look to the future, five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Right, right. What's that going to look like? And how are the folks like me and, and folks of the generation behind me, how are we going to make decisions and how are we going to support that from a yeah. vendor side? That's really an interesting topic and probably deserves more time than we have today to talk about. But it's certainly good to put that out there. I would love to hear what some of our listeners think about this. Maybe we'll get some questions from them. But you mentioned pump testing. 
And this is a topic I really want to talk about because you can't really think about hydro without mentioning pump testing. And I really believe that hydro is the true industry leader in this area. When hydro opened its 46,000 square foot world-class pump testing lab in 2010, I was there. I was so proud to be there for the grand opening. And of course, I've been there many times since. And it's so impressive. Every time I'm there, I see something new and something innovative. And of course, it was really innovative then. And that was, uh, what, 11 years ago now. And then, of course, Hydro made history in September of 2015 by being the very first recipient of the Hydraulic Institute Pump Test Lab Approval Program. So tell our listeners just a little bit about why this test lab is so special. Well, I would just couch that I'm very biased because I've I've been at the lab for 10 years. So, you know, take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. I think, I, think it's, it's, I think it's valid. Whatever you're going to say is well, probably valid. Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm, I'm just trying not to, you know. Go ahead and brag I, I on Hydro. I don't come off too confident about it because, it's, you know, that's certainly been where I've Well, tell us why you think. Why do you think this te- test lab is so special? Well, I think it really comes back to Hydro's culture of being independent. You know, when you come to our lab, and a lot of times, whether it's a pump that we've repaired or a pump that another OEM has made or repaired, Our charge at the lab is to really just give you unbiased data in how it performs. We don't care if it underperforms, overperforms, performs exactly how it should. Our goal is to give the most accurate data possible so that the end user knows exactly how that pump is going to operate in the field. Right. That's really it, is that that independent and unbiased view. And then pushing the envelope in terms of understanding how equipment performs. So you talked about the Hydraulic Institute certification, and that that was a big feather in our cap for sure. But I'll tell you some of the things that are really important related to that. So when you test the pump, you're not just measuring the static performance at a given flow rate, given pressure, given power, and then the efficiency of it. How you do that matters tremendously. But also, understanding the volatility in those measurements is important. But but don't you think it's also the results that you get from the testing? And like you said, you know, it it matters not to you whether it's overperforming or underperforming, but but that data tells you something and it tells you what you need to know to provide a solution for the customer, for the end user. And that to me is why it's so important. And not every facility has that in-house. I mean, a lot of people come to you guys because they don't have that capability. Absolutely. I mean, I'll, I'll tell a quick story. Okay. Uh, tested a pump for a, this was for a steel mill local to Chicago. So right in our backyard there in Indiana. We tested the pump just to see the as-found performance. Hey, this has been in service for a long time. We just want to see what it does so that we understand when it goes back into service, what it's going to do. Lo and behold, we find that the pump is no longer performing anywhere near its original equipment manufacturer curve. But beyond that, it seems that over time, they've changed the way they operate this equipment. And instead of operating with, let's say, three pumps in operation and standby pump, and then a spare, now they're operating all four in the system, which means if they lose one, now they've got reduced production capability. But on top of that, they're operating four pumps, four high energy pumps at the same time. It's a lot of money in terms of power. People forget the main cost of a pump is not in the actual purchase of a pump or the maintenance of a pump. It's in the power that goes into operating the thing. What we're able to do is we're able to identify that this pump no longer meets its original performance curve. That's step one. Now you know what you have. Now we have a problem to solve. How do we either bring it back to the original equipment performance curve or how do we build a custom solution that meets the new 2020 version of what the customer's demands are, not the 1970 version? Right? Uh, yeah, we sure. know that processes change. We know that demands change. And in turn, equipment needs to be able to meet those demands. So we redesign the impellers. We go through a series of tests to to trim them and sort of, you know, get that performance exactly where they want to be. Test it on our test stand, prove it out, show the difference, you know, before and after, if you will. End user approves. And we go ahead and we do that same modification to all six of their pumps. And now they're able to operate with just three pumps. They've taken a pump offline altogether. Well, when you take 2,000 horsepower offline and that pump was running 24-7, that is a tremendous amount of savings in terms of power. The payback for the end user was something like, I don't want to speak out of school, but it was less than two years. Wow. Just, to, just to come out even in terms of the investment. There's 
tremendous value just from testing and seeing what you have and understanding what you need. Interesting and profound. As we talk about the future of manufacturing, do you think most companies that you work with are effectively preparing for the future? I think in some form or another. And I think that there's a general sense that this is the way we're going, whether we go today, tomorrow, or next week. Ah, uh, good point. I think yeah. we're all on the same page that the digital shift is happening. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. This has been really a good and fun conversation. I'm learning so much from you. I wish we had more time to talk a little bit more about the future of manufacturing, but I think we hit some really cool topics. I want to thank you for being here and sharing your knowledge and expertise, but I also want to give you the last word. So I want to give you the opportunity to kind of wrap it up and tell us anything else that you want to say about what you see as the future of manufacturing. Well, I think I'm very open to, to changing my view on it because I think we do live in a very dynamic world that's changing all the time. So I'll just say that at the, that at the top. But I would say that I think it's going to take partnership between end users and companies like Hydro that is really going to make the most impact in terms of how we maintain assets when it comes to condition monitoring, but more importantly, just how we operate in general. I think the partnership model is the way to go. I think we like to live in sort of a transactional world. But I think at the end of the day, when it comes to the industrial world, the transactional world is not going to get us where we need to go. I think that's a, a brilliant point, And it makes so much sense. And it is fluid. I mean, it's changing all the time. What we see is the future of manufacturing. Tomorrow, you might have a different answer. <laughs> There's so many new things out there that, gosh, that I could ask you that question every day and you'd always have always have something different to say, probably. But that's cool. That's a good way to wrap it up. I just want to thank you so much, Ari. Thanks again for being here. And oh, thanks wanna... for having me, Michelle. Yes, Happy and please come it. and please come back. I always encourage the listeners to send questions. And so if we may get some questions that you will need you to address and we might have another topic we want to talk about. So please come back anytime. Hydro is one of my greatest partners out there in the industry. And I've worked with them since the very beginning and they're great. And I want to just take one more opportunity to tell the listeners about the Hydro Test Lab, because this is near and dear to my heart and I'm so impressed with it. With an engineering first approach, Chicago's Hydro Inc. proves the impact of redesigned and engineered pumps by testing their real-time hydraulic and mechanical performance at its state-of-the-art test lab. It is in this 46,000-square-foot facility that Hydro develops and implements engineering modifications for improving the performance of critical pumps and then verifies that performance in the lab. Thanks to high-quality capabilities in testing vertical, horizontal, and submersible pumps, Hydro made history in September 2015 by becoming the first recipient of full certification of the new Hydraulic Institute Pump Test Lab Approval Program. This industry standard is designed to assist pump OEMs and other pump test laboratories to improve their current laboratory procedures and policies by working with a third-party auditor to develop and maintain accurate, uniform, and repeatable pump testing protocols. The program also helps participating organizations adhere to the requirements of the International Test Laboratory Accreditation Standard concerning test measurement equipment. In its continuing commitment to the pump industry, Hydro's state-of-the-art test lab is dedicated to the needs and requirements of the pump aftermarket. The test lab, strategically located at Hydro's service center in Chicago, services pump users throughout North America. Testing can be applied to new pumps, refurbished pumps, or re-engineered pumps with the focus being on reliability, assurance of meeting the required operating conditions, and measuring the actual changes in performance if a change was made. Learn about the advantages of certified pump testing by visiting www.hydroinc.com. A link is in the show notes. This brings us to the end of the show. Thank you so much for listening. Please do me a favor and subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on iTunes. If you have interesting information to share and want to contact me about being a guest on a future episode of this podcast, please send me an email at michelle at navigatecontent.com. You can also send me questions that I will have my expert guests answer for you on a future episode. 
And in the meantime, please check out my book series on modern manufacturing to read more than 30 real world case studies about how global companies are using smart technology and innovation to build the factory of the future. All the links to the books and articles mentioned in this podcast are in the show notes. Have a great week and please join me for the next episode of Factory of the Future.